Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to The Well Told Tale. Every week we bring you the finest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. The Well Told Tale is now available as a podcast on YouTube and via our Patreon page, where there are additional stories exclusively for patrons. Please do check out the link in the description if you're interested in that. Today we return to the Hyborian Age and the dark and dangerous world of Conan. This is later on in the legendary barbarian storyline. He is still a mighty warrior, but older, and his many triumphs have led him to the throne of Aquilonia, riches and power. But how will the legend fare when, stripped of all that power and wealth, will he be able to fight back alone as he once did? This is a Conan story, so expect graphic violence, soaring language, and medieval attitudes from our protagonist. That said, it's time to pull up a chair, relax, and enjoy the first half of The Scarlet Citadel by Robert E. Howard. Chapter 1 They trapped the lion on Shamu's plain, they weighted his limbs with an iron chain. They cried aloud in the trumpet blast, they cried, the lion is caged at last. Woe to the cities of river and plain, if ever the lion stalks again. Old Ballad the roar of battle had died away, the shout of victory mingled with the cries of the dying. Like gay-hued leaves after an autumn storm, the fallen littered the plain, the sinking sun shimmered on burnished helmets, gilt-worked mail, silver breastplates, broken swords, and the heavy regal folds of silken standards, overthrown in pools of curdling crimson. In silent heaps lay war-horses and their steel-clad riders. Flowing manes and blowing plumes stained alike in the red tide. About them and among them, like the drift of a storm, were strewn slashed and trampled bodies in steel caps and leather jerkins, archers and pikemen. The olifants sounded a fanfare of triumph all over the plain, and the hoofs of the victors crunched in the breasts of the vanquished as all the straggling, shining lines converged inwards like the spokes of a glittering wheel to the spot where the last survivor still waged unequal strife. That day, Conan, king of Aquilonia, had seen the pick of his chivalry cut to pieces, smashed and hammered to bits, and swept into eternity. With five thousand knights he had crossed the southeastern border of Aquilonia, and ridden into the grassy meadowlands of Aphia, to find his former ally, King Amalrus of Aphia, drawn up against him with the hosts of Strabonus, King of Koth. Too late he had seen the trap. All that a man might do, he had done with his five thousand cavalrymen, against the thirty thousand knights, archers and spearmen of the conspirators. Without bowmen or infantry, he had hurled his armoured horsemen against the oncoming host, had seen the knights of his foes in their shining mail go down before his lances, had torn the opposing centre to bits, driving the riven ranks headlong before him only to find himself caught in a vice as the untouched wings closed in. Strabonus's Shemitish bowmen had wrought havoc among his knights, feathering them with shafts that found every crevice in their armour, shooting down the horses, the Cothian pikemen rushing in to spear the fallen riders. The mailed lancers of the routed centre had reformed, reinforced by the riders from the wings, and had charged again and again, sweeping the field by sheer weight of numbers. The Aquilonians had not fled. They had died on the field, and of the five thousand knights who had followed Conan southwards, not one left the field alive. And now the king himself stood at bay among the slashed bodies of his house troops, his back against a heap of dead horses and men. Ophirian knights in gilded mail leaped their horses over mounds of corpses to slash at the solitary figure. Squat Shemites with blue-black beards and dark-faced Cothian knights ringed him on foot. The clangour of steel rose deafeningly. The black-mailed figure of the western king loomed among his swarming foes, dealing blows like a butcher wielding a great cleaver. 
riderless horses raced down the field. About his ironclad feet grew a ring of mangled corpses. His attackers drew back from his desperate savagery, panting and livid. Now, through the yelling, cursing lines rode the Lords of the Conquerors, Strabonus with his broad, dark face and crafty eyes, Amalrus, slender, fastidious, treacherous, dangerous as a cobra, and the lean vulture Sotholanti, clad only in silken robes, his great black eyes glittering from a face that was like that of a bird of prey. Of this Cothian wizard, Dark tales were told. Tousle headed women in northern and western villages frightened children with his name, and rebellious slaves were brought to a based submission quicker than by the lash with the threat of being sold to him. Men said that he had a whole library of dark works bound in skin flayed from living human victims, and that in nameless pits below the hill whereon his palace sat, he trafficked with the powers of darkness, trading screaming girl slaves for unholy secrets. He was the real ruler of Koth. Now he grinned bleakly as the kings reined back a safe distance from the grim, iron-clad figure looming among the dead. Before the savage blue eyes blazing murderously from beneath the crested dented helmet, the boldest shrank. Conan's dark, scarred face was darker yet with passion. His black armour was hacked to tatters and splashed with blood, his great sword red to the crosspiece. In this stress, all the veneer of civilization had faded. It was a barbarian who faced his conquerors. Conan was a Chimerian by birth, one of those fierce, moody hillmen who dwelt in their gloomy, cloudy land in the north. His saga, which had led him to the throne of Aquilonia, was the basis of a whole cycle of hero tales. So now the kings kept their distance, and Strabonus called on his Shemitish archers to loose their arrows at his foe from a distance. His captains had fallen like ripe grain before the Chimerian's broadsword, and Strabonus, penurious of his knights as of his coins, was frothing with fury. But Sotha shook his head. Take him alive! Easy to say, snarled Strabonus, uneasy lest in some way the black-mailed giant might hew a path to them through the spears. Who can take a man-eating tiger alive? By Ishtar is healed! By Ishtar, his heel is on the necks of my finest swordsmen. It took seven years and stacks of gold to train each. And there they lie, so much kites meet. Arrows, I say. Again, nay, snapped Sotha, swinging down from his horse. He laughed coldly. Have you not learned by this time that my brain is mightier than any sword? He passed through the lines of the pikemen, and the giants in their steel caps, and male brigandines shrank back fearfully lest they so much as touch the skirts of his robe, nor were the plumed knights slower in making room for him. He stepped over the corpses and came face to face with the grim king. The hosts watched in tense silence, holding their breath. The black-armoured figure loomed in terrible menace over the lean, silk-robed shape, the notched, dripping sword hovering on high. "'I offer you life, Conan,' said Sotha, a cruel mirth bubbling at the back of his voice. "'I give you death, wizard!' snarled the king, and backed by iron muscles and ferocious hate, the great sword swung in a stroke meant to shear Sotha's lean torso in half— but even as the hosts cried out, the wizard stepped in, too quick for the eye to follow, and apparently merely laid an open hand on Conan's left forearm, from the ridged muscles of which the mail had been hacked away. The whistling blade veered from its arc, and the mailed giant crashed heavily to earth to lie motionless. Sotha laughed silently. "'Tie him up, and fear not,' The lion's fangs are drawn. The kings reined in and gazed in awe at the fallen lion. Conan lay stiffly like a dead man, but his eyes glared up at them wide open and blazing with helpless fury. What have you done to him? asked Amalrus uneasily. 
Sotha displayed a broad ring of curious design on his finger. He pressed his fingers together, and on the inner side of the ring a tiny steel fang darted out like a snake's tongue. It is steeped in the juice of the purple lotus, which grows in the ghost-hunted swamps of southern Stygia, said the magician. Its touch produces temporary paralysis. Put him in chains and lay him in a chariot. The sun sets and it is time we are on the road for Korshamish. Strabonus turned to his general, Arbanus. We return to Korshamish with the wounded. Only a troop of the royal cavalry will accompany us. Your orders are to march at dawn to the Aquilonian border and invest the city of Shamar. The Arferians will supply you with food along the march. We will rejoin you as soon as possible with reinforcements. So the host, with its steel-sheathed knights, its pikemen and archers and camp servants, went into camp in the meadowlands near the battlefield. Through the starry night, the two kings and the sorcerer, who was greater than any king, rode to the capital of Strabonus, in the midst of the glittering palace troop, and accompanied by a long line of chariots loaded with the wounded. In one of these chariots lay Conan, king of Aquilonia, weighted with chains, the tang of defeat in his mouth, the blind fury of a trapped tiger in his soul. The poison which had frozen his mighty limbs to helplessness had not paralysed his brain. As the chariot in which he lay rumbled over the meadowlands, his mind revolved maddeningly about his defeat. Amalrus had sent an emissary imploring aid against Strabonus, who, he said, was ravaging his western domain, which lay like a tapering wedge between the border of Aquilonia and the vast southern kingdom of Koth. He asked only a thousand horsemen and the presence of Conan to hearten his demoralised subjects. Conan now mentally blasphemed. In his generosity, he had come with five times the number the treacherous monarch had asked. In good faith, he had ridden into Ophir and had been confronted by the supposed rivals allied against him. It spoke significantly of his prowess that they had brought up a whole host to trap him and his five thousand. A red cloud veiled his vision, his veins swelled with fury, and in his temples a pulse throbbed maddeningly. In all his life he had never known greater and more helpless wrath. In swift moving scenes the pageant of his life passed fleetingly before his mental eye, a panorama wherein moved shadowy figures which were himself in many guises and conditions, a skin-clad barbarian, a mercenary swordsman in horned helmet and scale-mail corselet, a corsair in a dragon-proud galley that trailed a crimson wake of blood and pillage along southern coasts, a captain of hosts in burnished steel on a rearing black charger, a king on a golden throne with the lion banner flowing above and throngs of gay-hued courtiers and ladies on their knees, but always the jouncing and rumbling of the chariot brought his thoughts back to revolve with maddening monotony about the treachery of Amalrus and the sorcery of Tsotha. The veins nearly burst in his temples, and cries of the wounded in the chariots filled him with ferocious satisfaction. Before midnight they crossed the Ophirian border, and at dawn the spires of Korshemish stood up gleaming and rose-tinted on the southeastern horizon, the slim towers overawed by the grim scarlet citadel that at a distance was like a splash of bright blood in the sky. That was the castle of Tsotha, only one narrow street paved with marble and guarded by heavy iron gates led up to it, where it crowned the hill dominating the city. The sides of that hill were too sheer to be climbed elsewhere. From the walls of the citadel one could look down on the broad white streets of the city, on minareted mosques, shops, temples, mansions and markets. One could look down, too, on the palaces of the king set in broad gardens, high-walled, luxurious riots of fruit-trees and blossoms, through which artificial streams murmured and silvery fountains rippled incessantly. Over all brooded the citadel, like a condor stooping above its prey, intent on its own dark meditations. The mighty gates between the huge towers of the outer wall clanged open, and the king rode into his capital between lines of glittering spearmen, while fifty trumpets pealed salute. But no throngs swarmed the white-paved streets to fling roses before the conqueror's hoofs. 
Strabonus had raced ahead of news of the battle, and the people, just rousing to the occupations of the day, gaped to see their king returning with a small retinue, and were in doubt as to whether it portended victory or defeat. Conan, life sluggishly moving in his veins again, craned his neck from the chariot floor to view the wonders of this city which men called the Queen of the South. He had thought to ride some day through these golden-chased gates at the head of his steel-clad squadrons, with the great lion banner flowing over his helmeted head. Instead, he entered in chains, stripped of his armour, and thrown like a captive slave on the bronze floor of his conqueror's chariot. A wayward, devilish mirth of mockery rose above his fury, but to the nervous soldiers who drove the chariot, his laughter sounded like the muttering of a rousing lion. Chapter 2 Gleaming shell of an outworn lie, fable of right divine, you gained your crowns by heritage, but blood was the price of mine. The throne that I won by blood and sweat, by crom I will not sell, for promise of valleys filled with gold, or threat of the halls of hell. The Road of Kings In the citadel, in a chamber with a domed ceiling of carven jet and the fretted arches of doorways glimmering with strange dark jewels, a strange conclave came to pass. Conan of Aquilonia, blood from unbandaged wounds caking his huge limbs, faced his captors. On either side of him stood a dozen black giants grasping their long-shafted axes. In front of him stood Sotha, and on divans lounged Strabonus and Amalrus in their silks and gold, gleaming with jewels, naked slave boys beside them, pouring wine into cups carved of a single sapphire. In strong contrast stood Conan, grim, blood-stained, naked but for a loincloth, shackles on his mighty limbs, his blue eyes blazing beneath the tangled black mane which fell over his low, broad forehead. He dominated the scene, turning to tinsel the pomp of the conquerors by the sheer vitality of his elemental personality, and the kings in their pride and splendour were aware of it each in his secret heart, and were not at ease. Only Tsotha was not disturbed. "'Our desires are quickly spoken, King of Aquilonia,' said Tsotha. "'It is our wish to extend our empire.' "'And so you want to swine my kingdom?' rasped Conan. "'What are you but an adventurer, seizing a crown to which you had no more claim than any other wandering barbarian?' parried Amalrus. "'We are prepared to offer you suitable compensation.' "'Compensation!' It was a gust of deep laughter from Conan's mighty chest. "'The price of infamy and treachery! I am a barbarian, so I shall sell my kingdom and its people for life and your filthy gold. Ha! How did you come to your crown, you and that pig beside you? Your fathers did the fighting and the suffering and handed their crowns to you on golden platters. What you inherited without lifting a finger, except to poison a few brothers, I fought for.' You sit on satin and guzzle wine the people sweat for, and talk of divine rights of sovereignty. Bah! I climbed up out of the abyss of naked barbarism to the throne, and in that climb I spilt my blood as freely as I spilt that of others. If either of us has the right to rule men, by crom, it is I. How have you proved yourselves my superiors?' I found Aquilonia in the grip of a pig like you, one who traced his genealogy for a thousand years. The land was torn with the wars of the barons, and the people cried out under oppression and taxation. Today, no Aquilonian noble dares maltreat the humblest of my subjects, and the taxes of the people are lighter than anywhere else in the world. What of you? Your brother, Amalrus, holds the eastern half of your kingdom and defies you, and you, Strabonus, your soldiers even now, are besieging castles of a dozen more rebellious barons. The people of both your kingdoms are crushed into the earth by tyrannous taxes and levies, and you would loot mine. Ha! Free my hands, and I'll varnish this floor with your brains. Sotha grinned bleakly to see the rage of his kingly companions. All this, truthful though it may be, is beside the point. 
Our plans are of no concern of yours. Your responsibility is at an end when you sign this parchment, which is an abdication in favour of Prince Arpello of Pelia. We will give you arms and horse and five thousand golden lunars and escort you to the eastern frontier. Setting me adrift where I was when I rode into Aquilonia to take service in her armies, except with an added burden of a traitor's name... Conan's laugh was like the deep, short bark of a timber wolf. Ah, oh, Pello, eh? I've had suspicions of that butcher of Pellia. Can you not even steal and pillage frankly and honestly, but you must have an excuse, however thin? Ah, oh, Pello claims a trace of royal blood, so you use him as an excuse for theft and a satrap to rule through. I'll see you in hell first. "'You're a fool!' exclaimed Amelrus. "'You are in our hands, and we can take both crown and life at our pleasure.' Conan's answer was neither kingly nor dignified, but characteristically instinctive in the man, whose barbaric nature had never been submerged in his adopted culture. He spat full in Amelrus's eyes. The king of Ophir leaped up with a scream of outraged fury, groping for his slender sword. Drawing it, he rushed at the Chimerian, but Sotha intervened. Wait, your majesty. This man is my prisoner. A side wizard, shrieked Amalrus, maddened by the glare in the Chimerian's blue eyes. Back, I say, roared Sotha, roused to awesome wrath. His lean hand came out from his wide sleeve and cast a shower of dust into the Ophirian's contorted face. Amalrus cried out and staggered back, clutching at his eyes, the sword falling from his hand. He dropped limply on the divan, while the Cothian guards looked on stolidly, and King Strabonus hurriedly gulped at another goblet of wine, holding it with hands that trembled. Amalrus lowered his hands and shook his head violently, intelligence slowly sifting back into his grey eyes. "'I went blind,' he growled. "'What did you do to me, wizard?' "'Merely a gesture, to convince you who was the real master.' snapped Sotha, the mask of his formal pretense dropped, revealing the naked, evil personality of the man. Strabonus has learned his lesson. Let you learn yours. It was but a dust I found in a Stygian tomb which I flung into your eyes. If I brush out their sight again, I will leave you to grope in darkness for the rest of your life. Amalrus shrugged his shoulders, smiling whimsically and reached for a goblet, dissembling his fear and fury. A polished diplomat, he was quick to regain his poise. Sotha turned to Conan, who had stood imperturbably through the episode. At the wizard's gesture, his men laid hold of their prisoner and marched him behind Sotha, who led the way out of the chamber through an arched doorway into a winding corridor, whose floor was of many-hued mosaics, whose walls were inlaid with gold tissue and silver chasing, and from whose fretted arched ceiling swung golden censers, filling the corridor with dreamy perfumed clouds. They turned down a smaller corridor, done in jet and black jade, gloomy and awful, which ended at a brass door over whose arch a human skull grinned horrifically. At this door stood a fat, repellent figure, dangling a bunch of keys, Sotha's chief eunuch, Shukeli, of whom grisly tales were whispered, a man with whom a bestial lust for torture took the place of normal human passions. The brass door let onto a narrow stair that seemed to wind down into the very bowels of the hill on which the citadel stood. Down these stairs went the band to halt at last at an iron door, the strength of which seemed unnecessary. Evidently it did not open on outer air, yet it was built as if to withstand the battering of mangonels and rams. Shukeli opened it, and as he swung back the ponderous portal, Conan noted the evident uneasiness among the giants who guarded him. Nor did Shukeli seem altogether devoid of nervousness as he peered into the darkness beyond. Inside the great door there was a second barrier, composed of heavy steel bars. It was fastened by an ingenious bolt that had no lock and could be worked only from the outside. This bolt shot back, the grill slid into the wall. They passed through into the broad corridor, the floor, walls and arch ceilings of which seemed to be cut out of solid stone. Conan knew he was far underground, even below the hill itself. The darkness pressed in on the guardsmen's torches like a sentient, animate thing. 
They made the king fast to a ring in the stone wall. Above his head, in a niche in the wall, they placed a torch so that he stood in a dim semicircle of light. The guards were anxious to be gone. They muttered among themselves and cast fearful glances at the darkness. Sotha motioned them out and they filed through the door in stumbling haste, as if fearing that the darkness might take tangible form and spring upon their backs. Sotha turned towards Conan and the king noticed uneasily that the wizard's eyes shone in the semi-darkness, and that his teeth much resembled the fangs of a wolf gleaming whitely in the shadows. "'And so, farewell, barbarian,' mocked the sorcerer. "'I must ride to Shamar and the siege. In ten days I will be in your palace in Tamar with my warriors. What word from you shall I say to your women before I flay their dainty skins for scrolls whereon to chronicle the triumphs of Tsothalanti? Conan answered with a searing Chimerian curse that would have burst the eardrums of an ordinary man, and Sotha laughed thinly and withdrew. Conan had a glimpse of his vulture-like figure through the thick-set bars as he slid home the grate, then the heavy outer door clanged and silence fell like a pall. And welcome back. I hope you enjoyed the first half of The Scarlet Citadel by Robert E. Howard. If you'd like to hear more classic science fiction and fantasy stories or just want to support The Well Told Tale, please do check out my Patreon page at patreon.com slash thewelltoldtale. There's a link in the description. I'll be back next week with the finale of this classic Conan story. I hope you can join me. <laughs>